Hi everyone. Welcome to the International Film Festival Rotterdam Afterthoughts. Um, I hope you enjoyed Friends and Strangers. My name is Michelle Carey. I'm one of the programmers at the International Film Festival Rotterdam. Um, and I'm very happy to be speaking with the filmmaker of Friends and Strangers all the way from Sydney, Australia. Um, James Vaughan, lovely to see you. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Uh, when one can feel the distance between Europe and Australia in so many ways, but it's, it's very special to have you. And congratulations <laughs> yeah. on the film. It's, um, I believe it might even be the uh, first Australian tiger we've ever had. So that's very exciting. I wanted to start with um, the film. Uh, you said it's sort of like um, sketches of a life of these two particular young people. So it's not necessarily a fully formed narrative. Um, we don't necessarily know their backgrounds. We just come into their lives in media res. And um, I wanted to ask you why you took that approach with your characters. Mm. I guess the, the narrative approach, I wanted it to feel, I wanted it to have some sense of the way life is lived, but also, um, a sense of, I guess for me, how I remember periods of my life and it's never really very well formed. It's often um, some episodes have a real kind of color and density and then there's big gaps. And so I wanted to have, I guess, a, a structure and a, a rhythm to the film that that built out from that sensation. Um, it also, I suppose, yeah, that, that kind of density of, of particular moments. Uh, I feel like it's true to actually, when you're living in the moment as well, things that uh, come together in sounds and think you might look at something and hear something or some, and then some, someone might say something to you after. Um, it was something that was really appealing to me um, and I guess also that they're just the sort of films that I really enjoy watching too so that I, that was a part of it I think. Yeah right and there are some shots um, I think particularly of the the opening shot and then also at the end when people are sitting on the banks of the the harbour that makes me think of um, 19th century European and Australian landscape and seaside paintings and um, I, I wanted to ask, um, and also you have this sort of old fashioned music, this lovely piano music, which also actually makes one think of like French new wave cinema. But I wanted to ask you, did you want your film set in this modern day to have any kind of um, connection to Australian history? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I suppose in some ways, actually, I feel like I would identify as a colonial artist, you know, I, the, these kind of pictures that you see at the start of a film, um, the officers who came here were kind of um, a bit awestruck and amazed, but also this kind of a naivety in the, the renditions of the landscape. Um, I, I, I guess they're there in the film because I feel a certain kind of affinity with that and I suppose the film is in a way an exploration of that um, that unresolved relationship. I, I, I'm not going to try and characterize it in any particular way but there is a, a, an unresolved um, I suppose it, it feels unresolved for, for white Australians here and um, I guess this film is an exploration of that um, and I felt that including aspects of our history um, was a way of underlining that that has been a constant from when we when we started. Um, I, I guess the it was it was also a way of accessing a kind of commentary on on the present too by by putting what you could say I think pretty safely is is quite a pedestrian sort of like a prosaic a relatively prosaic story. There's not not much happens, but. Um, that I, I suppose putting it in in context with how uh, significant the the arrival of white people was on this continent, um, and this is to a degree. I mean, it's it's one slice of it, but this is where it's ended up. That, and, and not not making any particular commentary one way or, or another. Although I think you could read you could read into it in plenty of ways. But that was 
yeah, a, delib a deliberate contrast, I suppose, from where it started and um, where it's at. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and when um, one of the things I also found very striking in the film is you have these beautiful sort of establishing shots throughout the whole film, really um, cuts to nature and then in the second half cuts to various parts of the, the city of Sydney. And the sound design, particularly in those moments, is really striking. You can really hear the ambience of the country or the city. It's, it's almost like this Ozu effect. And so I want to ask you about mm. the sound design because it's very important in, in the film, like mm. the sound bleeds between scenes. And then there's, of course, in the latter part of the, the film, this incredible atonal music, which almost has like a Kuleshov mm. effect on the narrative because the narrative is just a conversation. It's an everyday conversation, but this, this mm. music gives it this sort of ominous feeling. So mm. it's sort of a two part question, but I'm wondering if you can talk about the sound design. Mm. Well, I, yeah, sound is, has such a huge role in how we experience films. Um, and for me, in terms of sound and images together, it's always a question of perspective. Um, and sometimes those things can be taken for granted. You can hear what you see um, and see what you hear. And those things can just sort of be in lockstep together. But um, with the images in isolation and also with the sound in isolation, I really enjoyed and wanted to in this film um, explore it changes in perspective um, and to manipulate the the reliability of any any particular perspective and at times you're drawn into a a, a person's perspective um, but then you push you're pushed out of it uh, sometimes you're drawn into it but then there, there's kind of ripples that that disrupt it slightly even though you, you stay within it um, and I guess formally this is just something that I think is is a really interesting you know question within film who's who's who, who is the listener and who is the person watching? What does the camera represent? What does the microphone represent? Um, is it a kind of omniscient, you know, God kind of perspective that just sees sees everything, or is it, um, is yeah, those things can can be kind of um, diced up in in a hundred different ways, and and depending on what the film wants to achieve. But um, the sound for me was a really great way to, I suppose, provide a counterpoint to the images, which particularly in those those sort of pillow shot kind of sequences. Um, there's a kind of neutrality, almost like a documentary quality quality to them. And I wanted to contrast that with the sound that was almost, you know, like a seashell when you when you put it up against the ear, like a very internal, very super subjective, almost dreamlike, hazy quality. Um, and I just found, uh, yeah, I don't know, it was something that, that worked its way into the cut from an early assembly stage that those two things, those contrasts together, express something that I suppose was felt right to me and felt important to the, to the, to the film. Um, and that, that question of subjectivity and objectivity and the kind of dance between the two that, that is always there and always present in cinema. But that was, I suppose, like a really, uh, something quite fundamental, I've, yeah, for me in the construction of this film um sound played a yeah i think a really important role in giving giving a sense of that effect yeah there's that slippage between the diegetic and the non-diegetic mm. in the second half and just quickly i mean it seemed this is moving on from sound also like the first half of the film very feels very relaxed you know it's sort of um orally and and just to experience it in general and then the first half there's this sort of tension there um mm. was that intentional in the script yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you could also look at it. It's interesting that that's your experience of it because I feel like you could almost read it the opposite way too in that the first half, there's a sense of sort of emotional um, repression. And in the second half, the pressure of, it becomes somehow a bit less subjective, I feel, in the second half that there's you, you become a little more detached from the characters. Things become a little more, um, comedic and a bit more absurd and there's a distance there that is a bit of a relief actually um, so I mean I, I definitely see what you mean because the music has a huge role to play in in that visceral sense of um, dread that comes in the second half but I didn't want it yeah I guess again like the, the, these contrasts I wanted it to have even though there, there's dread there's probably also more comedy in the second half too um, and even though in the first half 
it's a little more gentle in how you experience it, but that it has its own kind of dread. Um, I, 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 I'm really interested in, in those sort of subject, the pole, you know, the poles, I suppose, that, that, that separate how we experience things and um, abstract kind of binaries. And, and the, in, in cinema, we, that, that sort of filtered through a sense, a, you know, a sensory experience. So the play between those two things, I suppose, I always find the most interesting place is the place in between somewhere suspended in a, in a tense way between those two things, um, because that's how we, we are all the time. We, we, we have abstractions to make sense of things, but in reality, we're, we're sort of in between these in, in a kind of imperfect gray zone all the time. Yeah, that's true. No, there's, there's almost like a slapstick element at, in, the, in the second mm. half, which is, is so wonderful and so unexpected. And I want to um, come to your characters, to a wonderful, um, particularly the, the character of Ray, your main character. Um, there seems to be some, not quite an ambivalence, but almost like a tension um, between his, you know, we presume a pursuit of an artistic career and artistic life but mm. some sort of something's holding him back a little bit. And I wonder if you mm. can talk a little bit about that, if, if that's really there in his, in his mm. mind. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I didn't want it so much to be something that was particular to him personally, but rather for me, it was an important, it was important that it was a sense that it was something that was there in the world. And I guess the world is, is Australia in this film, it's Sydney. Um, it's there in Ray in particular, but only because I feel like that's a that's a feature of our culture in a way. We have a very even in in the sort of humanities educated kind of people who go to university because they want a, a career or a life in the world of ideas. There's still a profound ambivalence and unease and almost emba embarrassment um, about admitting that, um, even with you know whether it's family or, or acquaintances or in the workplace um very yeah un, un, and again uh, quite an unresolved um relationship we have with intellectual work um and the, the ray character is is you, there's almost no references to to what he there's some some kind of coded references that maybe he was yeah he's involved in film um but i just i i wanted i, I felt like that was an important reflection on, I guess, where Australia is at with with how we treat artists, how we think about ideas. Um, for, for whatever reason, we don't feel totally comfortable, whether that's the separation we have from and always had from Europe and, and that sense, particularly in the 20th century in, in the artistic, you know, avant-garde, there was always a sense that, well, we're really inheriting things from overseas and, and even that there's a sense of futility I suppose and always has been around discussions of a really high-minded nature because it's like well whatever we discuss we're still working with ideas that are borrowed from somewhere else um maybe it's just better off if we don't bother talking about it at all um whereas I, I guess in in the countries that really influence Australia culturally the UK and, and Germany and France and yeah I guess Western Europe um there was probably for hundreds of years a sense that in, you know to different degrees and different times that that the the intellectuals the the academics the artists really were at and, and this is all part of you know european imperialism and the arrogance and all, all, all of that that is tied in with it but whether you agree or disagree there was certainly a sense that it was really uh, genuinely at the vanguard of ideas um and i guess this is something australia's never really had um, could can never really honestly say about itself that we're at the, the sort of the vanguard of uh, I don't think that it necessarily always has to be like that but I think it has colored how Australians regard people that have chosen to put themselves in a situation or in a field or in a in a vocation where they uh, part of the job is talking talking about ideas as if as if they're original and as if um, yeah, there's an Australian instinct to just shut to shut that down, really, and just say sit back down and and go away. Um, so for Ray and and Alice, they're both coming to terms with, I suppose, the ambivalence that, that I think all Australians, even the ones that want to, want a career in the arts, have with speaking openly just about ideas in general. And um, there's no ideas spoken about in the film, really. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> I thought that was. Um, 
Yeah, no, I thought that was so brilliantly encapsulated in the, the conversations between Ray and David, this wealthy tech business guy who has that incredible mm -hmm. house, because even though he doesn't really understand art, he sort of professes an interest in it, you know, I mean, there's that mm. crazy art all throughout that house. Can you tell mm. us a bit more about this incredible house with this like, mm. just out there artwork? Yeah, yeah. Well, we were so lucky to have, uh, it's, a, it's an art collector, Kate Smith, uh, her husband, Ben Smith, who gave us access to that house. And we, we, we didn't put anything on the walls. It was all, we just left it exactly as it was. Um, oh, so that we art so actually to belongs that. to that house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do anything. Um, and they were so generous, I guess, in just letting us, you know, I met up for a coffee with Kate. I'd been to that house once very randomly. Um, with, I, I, when I arrived, I was like, why, you know, why am I here? It was, there was like a kind of someone I knew from work, knew the owner, knew, knew Kate, and I just found myself there as a friend. And I guess it just stayed with me for years while I was writing the script. I never thought I'd, I'd have access to it again, but I met up with her for a coffee and she said, she said, yeah, just really generous about, about us using it. So I, the film wouldn't have been the same really, because the script was written for that house and we were very lucky to have access to it. Yeah, wow. And again, coming back to your um, characters and your actors, can you tell us more about them? Obviously you have these sort of two leads, but then you have a number of characters in the background who are all just as wonderful as, as the leads. Can you tell us how you found your, your characters? Mm. A lot of them were people I met one way or another and knew straight away. Uh, sometimes, I feel like, I don't know, I'm sure everyone has this, you meet people and it's like, wow, that was just a, there's something about that person, <laughs> you know, they're slightly larger than life or a sense that, uh, yeah, they don't quite operate by the, the same sort of normal, fairly kind of boring rules that the rest of us, you know, feel like we should we should follow socially. Um, and maybe also an impulse as well about how someone could, you know whether whether or not they would enjoy the pressure, the weird pressure of being, you know, in front, put in front of a camera, and and, and sort of being put on the spot to be charismatic um, in front of a, a group of like fifteen people. And occasionally, I guess, yeah, I just it's maybe it's a bit twisted, but I I, I keep a kind of diary of, of people like you know when I when I meet people like that, and I just think some people, some of them are people I know really well, and some of them are, some of the people you know I might meet at a you know, at a, at a friend's house or something, but all, most of those characters were written for, um, they were written for the people who, who ended up playing them. Uh, and I, it was like a sort of, I guess, a collaboration really, where I would ask, ask them, oh, you know, I'm thinking about this character and it might be a sort of slight deviation from who they are, but um, embodying some of the same characteristics. And um, yeah, obviously that person has to be up for it and they have to be, um have to be excited about doing it but i just have found that that works really well in um in getting a, a performance that's maybe a little more unguarded or something um and it, it doesn't always work there are plenty of parts in this film uh actually though more often than not they were they were it was where i'd written the part for someone else they couldn't do it and then a bit of a mad scramble in pre-production to try and find someone else who could and yeah it was generally those those casting decisions when it was just settling for someone to do a part that was written for someone else that was often when it backfired and those those people aren't in the film um so I did learn a lot with that but um yeah these these minor characters I suppose again in thinking about binaries and counterpoints I, I'm drawn for whatever reason to lead characters that almost give nothing away um but against these small characters who appear and disappear within a pretty short space of time but give way too much away of themselves um and it's almost like that they're an overload and then, and then they're gone um i don't know i don't know what what it is about about that contrast i like but i just i just do <laughs> great and um just to finish up one of your characters for example is diane i think her name is that the friend that alice meets for coffee and mm -hmm. she sort of looks like she's going to be part of the story a lot more and we see her walking around the mm. botanic gardens and then she's just completely gone. Why yeah, yeah, that? yeah. 
Well, she actually was part of the story a lot more. Um, there's a whole other part of the film that isn't in the film now. Um, as, as I've told you, as you, you know, you, I know you've seen that extra part. Um, I'm hoping, I, it's my intention for that actually to be the beginning of my next film because I really love that whole part. Um, and I, in, in conceiving this film, I like the idea of a sort of Marvel universe of, you know, I, I guess it's like, <laughs> it, it's become a kind of something that's a bit grotesque, but I don't see, I mean, it's always, it's always appealed to me, this kind of very porous boundary between, between films and yeah, there's lots of other writers and filmmakers who've worked in that way, but it just, it, it seems for me, it, it seems to make sense when you're working with people um, who play versions of themselves for those characters to exist kind of beyond, you know, the start and end point of the film. And for that, for, for the storylines, particularly working with incomplete, fragmented um, and, and sort of non-linear storylines for those to, to sort of wind through and over and between and around different film projects. Um, that is really exciting to me. And I always wanted this film to have that, that spirit. Um, I probably bit off more than I could chew a little bit with the original structure, it was like over two hours long and it just the different parts weren't quite coming together. But um, with that third section, the, the Diana character who's a really good friend of mine uh, and a yeah, person who's very dear to me, uh, it, was, it was actually hard. Yeah, it was hard to tell her that most of the grueling kind of stuff out in a national park that we shot together wasn't gonna be in this film, but it's my, my, my big plan for this year is to write a film that takes the 20 or so, 25 minutes that we've shot for that and um, uses that as the first 20 minutes for the next film. Ah, to be continued. I love it. To be continued. <laughs> well, thank you so much, James, for the conversation. Um, and thank you out there, audience. Hope you've enjoyed this and um, enjoy the rest of your IFFR. And James, we hope to see you back here with your next film. Thank you. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.